Hare Krishna. So I'm grateful to be here with all of you today. Today we are discussing from one of the more sobering sections of the Srimad Bhagavatam. So this is describing the plight of the of the living being in the mother's womb. And while describing this plight, the the focus of the Bhagavatam is on illustrating what the Bhagavad Gita talks about how Dukkha is in unavoidable in this world. That this world is Dukkha Alaya. So, some time ago one devotee called me, he said, he said that my faith is completely shaken. He said, okay, what happened? He said, when I was introduced to Bhakti, you know, I, I was told about this section in the Bhag- Bhagavatam which talks about gynecology and how there is advanced scientific knowledge over here. And he said, I was recently uh, giving a session and when I was talking about this, how there is advanced scientific knowledge, there was one boy he, in the class, he said, Actually, you are saying that the child in the, the embryo is bitten by worm, worms. But there are no worms in the womb. So, it is completely wrong. And he said that, this, he was speaking to a group of medical students. And they said, yes, we have studied it. There's no, there, is no, there are no worms in the womb. So, there are worms in the intestine and there are many kinds of germs over there, but the womb is actually a very protected place. So, he said, I felt so humiliated and confused. So, I said, is the Bhagavatam wrong? Is, the, is my having faith in the Bhagavatam, am I mistaken in having the faith? If the Bhagavatam is the word of Krishna, how could it be wrong? Uh, if it is the word, if it is Shastra, how could it be wrong? And uh, how do I understand this? So, the topic I will talk about in the basis of our faith. What is and what should be. You know, we all have certain things on which we base our faith and often what we base our faith on need not be the actual essential basis for our faith. So, I'll take this particular thing as an example and we'll focus on this principle of basically Prabhupada talks about there are principles and there are details. So, there are details. Sometimes our faith may be based on certain details but our faith needs to be based on principles. Mm -hmm. So that's the point I will try to discuss today and we will try to keep some time for question answers at the end. Basically, there are many different ways in which faith can be awakened. And for that, there are There are many strategies uh, that can be used for helping people to develop faith. Mm-hmm. So, for example, now, if we are considering faith, generally, if we consi- most people live in the material domain. And Krishna is spiritual, ultimately, of course, Krishna is not just spiritual. Krishna controls the material domain also. The spiritual domain and the material domain. So now, because we live in the material domain and we want to develop faith in the spiritual domain. So quite often, this is the faith we want to develop. But the journey of faith often goes through the material domain. 
So now through the material domain means, I'll talk about three different things. The so one is, it's like at a practical sense, when Shri Prabhupada came back, went to America and came back to India, he had brought Western people with him and they had started practicing bhakti. Now seeing those Western people practicing bhakti actually attracted Indians and gave them some faith. Now when we are using the word faith over here, it is Shraddha in the sense of that initial faith. The word Shraddha can mean many different things, but in the ninth stages of bhakti, Shraddha, Prabhupada translates almost like favorable curiosity. Or maybe there is something of value over here. Let me explore this. So, that Shraddha in general is developed by something materially impressive. So, the materially impressive could be that successful, powerful people are practicing spirituality. So, in today's world, at least in India, the West is considered to be successful. Indians are infatuated with that white skin. So, Western people practicing bhakti, that was very impressive. Traditionally also, if the kings would bow down to sages, that would impress the general masses. Oh, these sages are poor, they have nothing. The kings have everything. Why are the kings bowing down to the sages? Maybe there is something, maybe these sages have something special. So, generally people need to see something materially impressive. So, it could be successful, powerful, could be people, it could be mm, structures. Structures means, in the past, there could be giant buildings which would be temples. Even now Prabhupada tried to adopt that by having magnificent temples, that would attract people. So the idea is, for most people, the initial attraction from the material to the spiritual, or uh, attraction towards the spiritual, comes through something material. Now another thing could be miracles, or mystical powers, you know, every religious tradition has this, I, this thing about miracles. Say, in the Christian tradition, Jesus is said to have taken one item of food and multiplied it, or he's walked over the ocean, or the God is supposed to have parted the sea. In our tradition, we have Krishna lifting up the Govardhan hill. We have a bridge being built across the ocean by the Vanaras. So there are miracles. Things which do not seem to happen normally. And they happen. And it is not just in scripture. Many times people start following some um, Baba or taking up some path because you know, they were sick and nothing was getting cured. And not, nothing was working for curing them. And they did something and they got cured. So it seemed like a miracle to them. So Christians often weaponize this. And often you, not all Christians, there are some Christians who are try to use tamasic means, they have what is called faith healing. And actually there is no healing, but there is an illusion created. And you know, if faith healing were working as much as they claim it works, you now why do they have to fund any hospitals at all? Isn't it? You now why do they have to have any hospitals at all? You could just... So the point, but this is how sometimes faith develops. Now, another way, something material impress, impressive can develop our faith, is facts and figures. So, every religious tradition has this tendency to try to claim, now, because nowadays science is the influential body of knowledge. So, every tradition, if you just Google and search, advanced science in the Bible, advanced science in the Quran, advanced science in the Vedas, and uh, advanced science in the Guru Granth Sahib, you know, you will find something or the other there. Now, how persuasive it is, it is open to question. But, uh, people need something materially impressive to come toward the spiritual. So now, when we use this, it is a strategy. And if you see, many times our Acharyas, they have downplayed mystical powers, they have downplayed miracles. Although Krishna does perform miracles, and devotees may also have mystic powers. But devotees generally don't use mystical powers to attract people to Krishna. Because the point is, through mystical powers, 
when people are attracted their primary attraction is more toward the mystical powers than to the lord who is the source of mystical powers mm. and so the idea is when we use something material to establish faith in the spiritual it is always a questionable strategy why because it may work in a different way they will build a large temple to attract people's faith towards krishna and instead of attracting people's faith that may attract people's envy and that's why invaders may try to come and destroy the temple plunder the temple mm -hmm. so it can have the opposite effect you know if somebody if somebody tries to base, base faith on miracles then okay maybe one miracle has happened but there are 10 others which are claimed to be miracles and in no organization has a universally accept no religion also has a universally accepted body that will certify this is a genuine miracle this is a <laughs> bogus thing the catholic church has a body which tries to certify miracles but by the time they take to certify the miracles you know they, they, it has already spread like wildfire among people so it just doesn't work you now somebody may claim okay we saw the deities having tears on their face and now was it really true was it somebody's imagination was it optical illusion what was it so you know, it's very difficult to know this so the point is that if somebody's faith is developed by seeing some something which is claimed to be miracle the miracles krishna can certainly do but there's one true miracle there are 10 things which are claimed to be miracles but they are proven to be false and somebody whose faith is developed by seeing miracles then after that if some other thing which is claimed to be a miracle is proven to be false that person may think okay maybe the previous one was also false and the faith will not be steady so for us there is the journey of shraddha and then after that there is the next stage of faith is nishtha and the key that takes one from shraddha to nishtha is actually anartha nivrutti anartha nivrutti means that we experience personal transformation we experience for ourselves the change so for example if we go to a doctor now initially our faith in that doctor at faith in the sense of the favorable curiosity to go to that doctor may be awakened in many different ways it may be because a friend told us you know this go to this doctor he works very well maybe on the doctor's website we saw pictures of a person who who was very sick and that person has become very healthy maybe somebody was crippled or paralytic and now they have become an athlete and they are very athletically fit oh such a big transformation maybe by seeing that develops our faith now anyway the initial faith is developed the important thing is if the medicine works for us and we are positively cured maybe not completely cured but significantly on the cured and on the journey of healing then that faith will be much stronger and even if say somebody proves okay that photo that the doctor had put over there that was a false photo that was a doctor photo okay maybe but my faith is not based on the that particular photo my faith is based on my experience that i have seen the transformation and this comes this anartha nivrutti happens through bhajana kriya through the again personal practice i i need to practice like i need to take the medicine and then after i take the medicine i experience improved health and then there is firm faith so <clears throat> because we live in a world where science is quite prominent and prestigious both so there is a natural tendency to try to sh to show the credentials of spirituality rather to help people develop faith in spirituality through the medium of science mm -hmm. now 
I, I have a website named Science Spiritual Scientist. So I have studied this subject quite a bit. And I have over time, my own understanding has refined about what are the approaches that work and what is it that works the best. Mm. So broadly speaking, there could be two ways. Science is wrong, scripture is right. Mm. This is one way to go about it. And we can give a list of, you know, science had this theory and that theory was prone to be false and then science had that theory and that theory was prone to be false and then that theory, that theory was prone to be false. And science keeps changing. It keeps, it, it, further research keeps proving that the theories are false. And therefore, we should follow scripture. That is one approach. The other could be, yeah, science is right, but scripture already told this before. Hmm? You know, what is, what is given over here, scripture has already given this long ago. And in that way, we try to prove that science is nothing new, nothing exciting, nothing special. Actually, scripture already told this. So, the broadly, there are these two approaches. Now, within that, there can be further nuances. But, let's look at these two approaches, broadly speaking. And then, we'll look at a third approach, which I, I find the most effective in today's world. So, as I said, these are strategies. And depending on what works, we use it. So, these can also work. Now, science is wrong, scripture is right. Now, uh, it can seem, okay, scientists had this theory and this theory proved to be wrong and scientists did this experiment and that went wrong and this had this effect, that had that effect. That is true. But often, if you look at scientists, they don't portray the wrongness of science as a weakness. They portray it as a strength. That who told you that science was wrong? We only told you it is wrong. So, we have an internal self-critical system by which we critique our findings. And that's how we come closer and closer to the truth. So, they say, now there are some people who use science to claim absolute certainty. But scientists say, we never claim absolute certainty. We are only claiming or uh, providing some understanding and our understanding is evolving. And their argument is, there's one prominent atheist says, says, the difference between science and religion is, science is slowly becoming more and more right, religion is permanently wrong. <laughs> permanently round, wrong and proudly wrong. They say, so now that is their way of looking at things, that's of course not correct. But the point is, in today's world, if somebody claims I am right and you are wrong, no, it quite often is seen as arrogance. Now, how, how do you know that you are right? Oh, scripture is right. How do you know? No, scripture is the word of God, therefore it's right. So, it is how it becomes, it sometimes becomes like circular reasoning. That God is right, and therefore scripture is right. But how do you know scripture is right? Because scripture is the word of God. <laughs> how do you know scripture is the word of God? Because it has come from God. Well, where do you start the proof of this? You get, it's circular reasoning. And it doesn't really work for many people. Now, for some people it can work. But the point is that this doesn't always work. It can be used as a, it's a starting point. Many starting points could work. Now, the other is science is right. So, if we say science is wrong, they say science is self-critical. Now, they say religion is not self-critical. In religion, if their understandings are wrong, are they ready to change it? We say our understandings are never wrong. But then, can we really prove that all the time? Now, we can in some ways. I'm not going to go into that. Because we'll, we'll talk about this when we come to a little later. What is essential and what is peripheral? Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> now if you use the word religion, what all is there in religion? Which aspect of it is the core part of religion? Which aspect of it is not the core part of religion. So that is all to be explored, which is a big subject. Now the other point is that, okay, 
sciences found this, but religion had this long ago. Hmm? So, for example, science has developed airplanes. In the Vedas, we already have Vimana Shastra. Ravan had a Viman. So, uh, the advanced technology is not all that advanced. We all had all that before only. Now, if we look at science seriously, what science says, so there is a difference between what's, how serious scientists think and then there are people who are simply proud of science. And they make statements based on science. So see, science is a body of knowledge. And atheists have used science or misused science to promote atheism. Science is neither theistic nor atheistic. Science is just a way of looking at the world. So science has many times been misused by atheists. And that's why sometimes we equate science with atheism. In the book, Life Comes From Life, where Prabhupada seems to be very strong in criticizing scientists. If you read it carefully, what we'll find, there's one statement Prabhupada says, we are not against the knowing spirit of science. Knowing means wanting to know, learning, curiosity. He says, we are against their atheism. So you could put this way, that science is a way of knowing, a way of looking at the world. Science has many things. You can have science as a product of the way of knowing also, but there's a scientific method. Now, science could be used by theists and could be used by atheists. So, atheists can use science, sorry, atheists can use science to try to justify atheism. Hmm? And theists can use science to justify theism. But science itself is a body of knowledge. It's a, it's a way of looking at the world which leads to certain knowledge that comes up. So now, see, now if you consider in between, you could say here, there is a scientist. Now scientist could be a theist, scientist could be an atheist. Now what scientists say is that the speciality of science is not so much the result that it achieves but the process by which it achieves the result. What do I mean? That, that science is able to make a plane fly. That's what common people see and are impressed. But they say, what is the speciality of science is? That there is a process that we understand and we can repeat. That is what makes science special. Now, you may say spirituality may say that, oh, you know, some sacred texts may say, oh, the Vimanas were there in the past with us. But, can you replicate the Vimanas? Oh, that is a mystic power. That people don't have the mystic power. Then you can't replicate it. So, so what happens is, it's science doesn't give you the result, but science gives you the process to get the result. And the special thing about science is, it provides us a repeatable process, a demonstrable repeatable process. So, when we start claiming this knowledge is already given in science, even, even in scripture, then we have to be careful about what we are claiming. So now, just a few days ago, there was an article in the Guardian. I was quite surprised. Guardian is a very left-wing paper which is quite against India. But there was an author who is quite an Indian specialist and is relatively an India sympathizer, Christopher Dalrymple. So he wrote about how India has contributed to math and to architecture and so many other fields. So he talks about how zero has come from India, but India is not given the credit for that. So that is his new book, and it's an excerpt from his book. So, now there are definitely things. So, for example, the concept of zero, it has come from India, although often credit is given to the Ara Arab world for that. From India, it went to the Arab world, from there it went to the West. Now, there is reasonably strong evidence that the Pythagoras theorem uh, was propagated, was talked about by Baudhayan. So there are definitely quite a few facts which are given in the Vedic texts. We could say Vedic text is a very broad body which is, which later science discovered. So this is also a useful approach. However, we have to be careful. If somebody says, oh, you know, cloning is already there in the Mahabharata. Okay, how the Mahabharata, the Pandava, the Kauravas were cloned. Well, initially it might seem impressive, but there are many problems. Clones are identical. 
the kafur, the hundred kauravas, they were not identical. Maybe they had a similar demoniac mentality. In that sense, they were identical. But they didn't have the same body. So that's not cloning, uh, technically speaking. And cloning means you have one form from which you get many other forms. Hmm? So uh, they, these are, there was, there's not one form from which you got many other forms. There's one lump which was divided to 100. So when we make claims, what kind of claims are we making? There was one, one, one minister from nationalist minister from the northeast. He said, internet was already there in the Vedas. And he said, it was through a traditional version of the internet that the sages communicated. And that's how there's communication happening. Now, this is a, that person just became a, he was roasted on the social media. He was trolled and roasted. Now the point is, the sages may have had some mystical ways of communicating. But again, the point is, not just the result, the process. What impresses people today now is that everybody has access to the internet. Can whatever was the equivalent of the internet by which some kind of communication over distance was happening, can we provide that for everyone today using the Vedic means? No. So again, this is not to uh, reject this approach, but to recognize that if somebody's faith is developed by this approach alone, then the faith may come to question. Because sometimes that approach works, sometimes that approach doesn't work. So you have to be careful. Now, with this background, let's move towards the topic which is here. That here the discussion is of the child in the womb. So whenever we are studying scripture, the study of scripture is going on, there are two distinct things. There is the point under study, and there is the point of the point. What is the reason why this is being mentioned? Now, Parikshit Maharaj is on the verge of death. He is not interested in getting a degree in gynecology. <laughs> the Bhagavatam itself is not claiming to be a book on gynecology. The, the point of the book is to give us spiritual knowledge. Now, first of all, let me clarify one thing. Uh, how do we understand that the Bhagavatam says that a chi child is bitten by worms, uh, by, in the womb by worms, and there are said to be no worms in the womb? Well, first thing is, the Bhagavatam, when it is describing a journey of a child in the womb, hmm, that journey is describing a possibility. It is not describing a universality. Universality means this is how it happens for everyone. No, the specifics vary. Just like after we are born, do all of us have a, the same life journey? No, all of us have different life journeys. So, if our life journey after coming out of the womb is different, why should our life journey inside the womb be the same? Isn't it? Say, I mean, from a practical perspective, you know, say, different women may live different kinds of lifestyles. And not every woman may be able to necessarily live in a way which is most comfortable for the womb, for the child in the womb. So, it's natural that the child will have a significant level of different experiences. So now the, so the specific the example, like the Bhagavatam is giving a principle that parachandam na vidusha, that you can't know what the desire of the other child, other, another person is. And therefore the child is given, after coming out of the womb, the child is given something which the child does not need, the child does not want and which causes suffering to the child. And the example Prabhupada gives is that a child may be crying and the nurse may give the child some bitter medicine thinking that this is, the child is crying because of some pain in the belly. But the child might just be hungry. Hmm. Now, is this a possibility? Of course it's a possibility. But is this something that can ha will happen to every child? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. It can happen. The principle here is, is that the point and there's a point of the point. The, the point is specific. Prabhupada is giving a specific example. 
Now, th there may be many, many babies for whom there is ne never a nurse. There is only, maybe the mother is poor, the mother is, wants to be personally involved. So, all the care is taken by the mother only. So, there is no nurse. So, the mother, if the baby is crying, the first thing she will do is offer her breast milk. Why would she give some medicine beforehand? Maybe if the nurse is there and the mother is not available, the nurse may think, okay, if there is no milk available, let me give some medicine. So, it is certainly not a necessity that this is what has to happen all the time. So, the point is some example of how the child suffers. The, prince, the point of the point is that the child suffers. Hmm? And specifically, parachandam navidusha, that the child is not able to communicate. And the child is not able to communicate what it wants, what it does not want. That is a very difficult situation to be in. See, we may be suffering and recently when I was in UK, I was talking with one devotee. He was, uh, he was in a serious accident and he was not in coma, but he was like awake but unable to speak. So, he was not able to move his body, he was not able to speak. So, he said it was more than the physical pain was the was the frustration of not being able to communicate at all. Like, I wanted to meet someone, see someone, I was thinking if I die, I want to, you know, uh, reconcile with so and so person and I wanted that person to come and meet me or at least talk with them on phone. But it is just not possible. So, it's frustration. So, the point is that there, so, the point, the point is mm, some example of suffering. And the, prince, the point of the point is the reality of suffering. Suffering will come in some way or the other. So, it is important for us to not focus too much on the point or focus so much on the point that we forget the point of the point. So, uh, take, taking this point of possibility and inevitability or universality, now there is a possibility that there can be worms in the womb also. In some cases, if there is severe infection in the intestine, now there are inf the worms in the, inf in the intestine get multiplied and then if the infection spreads severely, the worms can come in the womb also. It is certainly not common, but it is certainly not unheard of. It is not impossible. It can happen. So, what the Bhagavatam is giving is a specific example of how a child may suffer in the womb. But that does not mean that the child will have to suffer all the time in that particular way alone. So, if we emphasize too much certain points that are not important so much. Say, for us, now when we are practicing bhakti, how important is it for us? How much of our faith is based on the fact that this precise, advanced gynecological knowledge in the third canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam? Uh, we, we may not even think about it much. If now our faith is largely coming from our own practice of Krishna consciousness and the transformation that we have experienced in us, the realizations that we have got, the higher happiness we have got, the freedom from cravings and unhealthy habits, the peace that we have got, the decrease in anxiety that we have experienced. If that, all that is the basis of our faith, then now, then why emphasize something else in the beginning? So, if we emphasize that which is peripheral, that which is not a central detail in the beginning, and then later on somebody finds out oh, this doesn't, this is not exactly the way I was taught, then the faith will be shaken. So, the Bhagavatam's point is that there is suffering in the world. That when we goes through life, there is suffering. And therefore, we should look for something higher to move from suffering. So, I'll conclude with, as I said, there are different approaches. And I found the approach that works is basically science and spirituality. You can say, a scripture talks about many things, but ultimately, scripture is about spirituality. Science is the study of matter. Spirituality is the study of what matters. 
Science is the study of matter. Spirituality is the study of what matters. What is really important in life? Now, in the Bhagavatam, when Parikshit Maharaj sat down to hear from Shukadeva Goswami, it was, what really matters now? I have a powerful kingdom. I have ruled the, uh, virtuously. But now that I am going to die, what is the most important thing? What really matters? He is not interested in the study of matter. The Bhagavatam may give us some knowledge about the study of matter. But we, fo we are studying, Parishit Maharaj approached the Bhagavatam not to get better knowledge of matter. Now, we can get better knowledge of the purpose of matter. What is the purpose of matter, material existence? But primarily, it is the study of what matters. When Krishna speaks to Arjuna in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna does not tell any battle strategies. Krishna does not tell Arjuna about how to use the Gandiva bow better. That is the study of matter and he has already learned it from Drona. When he is coming to Krishna, he is asking, Pruchamitvam dharma sammudha chetaha. Let, please tell me what is the right thing to do. What is it that matters the most for me at this particular point? Should I consider that doing my duty as a Kshatriya matters more? Or not attacking elders like Bhishma and Drona, that matters more. Tell me that. So spirituality is the study of what matters. And for us, when we chant Hare Krishna and we practice Bhakti, what happens by that is, we start understanding that Krishna matters more and more. How does our anxiety go down? How does our cravings go down? How do we experience greater happiness? Because for us, we connect with Krishna. So, study of what matters means what? We can say the spiritual journey. When we grow on the spiritual path, the, the path of spiritual growth, it means that initially, for us, the world is very big and God is very small. So, initially when I started practicing bhakti, I started sharing with my relatives. So, my uncle told me, yeah, I believe in God. He is happy there, I am happy here. <laughs> so, the idea is that God doesn't, even if God exists, God doesn't matter. But as we grow spiritually, the world becomes small and God becomes big for us. So, spiritual growth means we understand that Krishna matters more. Yes, in this world, sometimes I'll be famous. Sometimes I may be anonymous. Nobody may know me. Sometimes I may be criticized. Sometimes I may be praised. Sometimes I may be wealthy. Sometimes I may be poor. Sometimes I may be loved. Sometimes I may be neglected. Sometimes I may be healthy. Sometimes I may be sick. And these things do matter. But what matters much more is if I can connect with Krishna in my heart. If I remember Krishna, I remember that Krishna loves me. And I remember that by loving Krishna back, I will always be sheltered. And when we do that, that is what is the essence of spiritual growth. So for us, when there is, so at this stage, there might be some Shraddha. But it may or may not be there, but it is at this stage, there is Nishtha and more. Nishtha means God matters more. That my connection with Krishna is what matters the most. So for all of us, this is the basis of our faith. In whatever way we may have practiced bhakti, we have got some realization. Krishna is the most important thing. Now of course we may get tempted, we may get distracted. And it is also possible that sometimes in that situation something else matters more at that particular time. And we have to give attention to that. But overall, Spiritual growth is understanding that Krishna matters more. And when we are helping others on their spiritual journey, it's what is important is, we give them the process, we help them practice the process by which they can get that realization themselves. So instead, if we start focusing on how Material knowledge is given better in scripture than other sources. Well, okay, that's one way. 
but that's not the most important thing from wherever people get material knowledge it doesn't matter prabhupad when he was sick generally he took ayurvedic treatment but prabhupad was not not fanatical ayurveda only prabhupad was a pure devotee of krishna not a pure devotee of ayurveda isn't it <laughs> so when he was in uk when he had some emergency issues he had a procedure that was done through allopathy now is ayurveda better than allopathy well in some ways it is better but the important thing is that is it because ayurveda has come from the vedas and allopathy has come from the west so therefore we all have to dedicate our life to proving that ayurveda is better than allopathy no we don't have to and if in some cases somebody takes ayurveda they don't get cured and they take allopathy and they get cured should that shake their faith in krishna consciousness no it should not because we are not coming to shastra for material knowledge if shastra gives some material knowledge that's a additional benefit we can use it but we don't come to shastra for material knowledge and we don't base our faith in shastra on the material knowledge that it is giving our faith in shastra needs to be on based on the spiritual that inner transformation the spiritual transformation that it brings about so if it, to that end the approach that works today in today's world i find is not many people need spirituality to be proven scientifically i'll give three examples of this and i'll conclude see yoga has become so popular in the world now if you look at the scientific research about the benefits of yoga it's not really much there is some research but many many people have experienced the benefit themselves okay you know i i am i'm i'm fitter i am slimmer my body is more flexible so uh, they is they experience the benefit when somebody tries to practice yoga is it that they do a elaborate research of which scientific journal paper has published research at oh in science or in nature or here or there no if it works people really don't concerned so much about whether science has proven it or not mm. the second is with respect to our own tradition and mantra chanting now we may quote uh, the millions of people have tried out mantra chanting it may be hari krishna maha mantra it may be some other mantras but hari krishna mantra also many many people have tried out now, if you consider how much is scientific research that has been done on the potency of the hari krishna maha mantra in the maximum i have seen is there's one research done in the university of florida which we often talk about mantra power now that research is if you consider the standards of scientific research it was one research which has never been replicated and further studied and proven it was a it was just a phd thesis it was not published in a scientific journal what to speak of any high level scientific journal mm-hmm. and so in the like within the scientific credibility the credibility of that research is not very high i'm not saying that such research cannot be done or should not be done the point i'm making is those who have tried out mantra chanting their faith is not come from some unpublished phd thesis in some university in america that that has proven this that's why the, i have faith in chanting no that's not the basis at all i'm not minimizing the value of the study in any way i'm saying that so both yoga and mantra chanting actually the faith comes from the fact that it works in whatever purpose it is meant to serve now we are not telling that mantra chanting will imp- will improve your health but it will imp- it helps people find more peace it helps find people be- get more uh, freedom from cravings and addiction and things like that negativity and in that sense it works so if we consider from this perspective now among the various researches mindfulness is very big and mindfulness there is a good amount of research especially cognitive behavioral therapy cbt as there is a good amount of research in that but still if you read any book on mindfulness the most of the books contains any of the popular books on mind books book popular books on mindfulness the focus is on how to be mindful the focus is not so much on oh, you know, this search this research was done over here and this research was done over here this research was done over here so the age where people needed scientific proof to do what they were going to do 
that age is more or less over now hmm? there is the modern times and now largely we are moving towards post modern times here people choose based on not what science says is right they say on what works for them so we are in what is called a post modern age and that's why putting too much emphasis on science is not really required i wrote a book on reincarnation i've been traveling for the last 10 years in the west and there are hardly any times when anybody has seriously asked me is there scientific proof for the existence of the soul you know even if i tell organizers i would like to speak on this topic they say it's not a very interesting topic for people it's it's not a faith maker or a faith breaker i just present you know in the yoga text there is a model of the self in which there is a soul mind and body and okay it's a model let me try to understand does this model help me to understand myself better does it help me to function better in my life if it does okay let's move forward people are not there are some people definitely they would like to scientific proof of the existence of soul but that is not the basis of people's spiritual practice i have not met any person and i can't say that i have met a lot of people but i have i have not met any person who said i cannot practice spirituality because i don't have faith in the existence of the soul <laughs> that has not been an obstacle for anyone there are many other obstacles many people have more doubt about the existence of god than they have existence of the soul as far as i've seen <laughs> isn't it there's a whole group of people called atheists but there is no na name even for a group of people who don't believe in the soul <laughs> isn't it <laughs> <laughs> so the point is that we have to choose our battles so we help people develop faith in a way that won't cause their faith to be unnecessarily challenged in the future so rather than trying to show that spirituality is superior to science we say that spirituality fulfills certain needs that science does not fulfill that science yoga mindfulness mantra chanting these fulfill some needs that science does not fulfill and you can experience it yourself so there is space for science and there is space for spirituality there is space for in the vedic tradition there was space for ayurveda and there was space for adhyatma they were not competitors so we also don't have to position modern science and spirituality as competitors that both of them have their domains there are areas in which they overlap there are areas where there are apparent contradictions and they have to be dealt with but let sp spirituality can stand on its own feet spirituality doesn't need to stand on the shoulders of science so so i'll conclude i'll summarize what we discussed today so the topic i discussed was choosing the basis of our faith that our faith or others faith what do we base it on so i discussed three main points the first point was that about faith in the spiritual through the material so it could be anything materially impressive it could be people or pl objects like large temples kings or western people or whatever westerners who are considered successful things which are materially impressive hmm? then it could be miracles or mystic powers where something which is normally not possible that is done through spirituality and then there are facts and figures oh what science does not know or what science got wrong or what science got later we have already got it in the past so now each of these approaches it could be useful but it depends sometimes it's a strategy for us when we want to develop our faith the key point is that if we start with something which is uh, which is shakeable then afterwards we'll get shaken so we talk specifically about science and spirituality i talked about is science is wrong spirituality is right hmm? that is one approach 
but the point is scientists can always say that we are self critical so we are actually humble in our pursuit of knowledge but you are arrogantly you arrogantly claim to be right and you don't scrutinize yourself and that's how blind faith goes about there's a possibility of that then that is we already knew this that you came up with all this later now it's possible but it depends is it really true when we say the two things i discuss about it some things may be that the end result is given but science offers us not just the result but the process to do it the process in a repeatable way and that is what is the strength of science so <clears throat> there are the approaches can be used but they can be problematic also so the last point i discuss is the best is science and spirituality both have their domains science is the study of matter and there are various ways in which study matter can be studied and it is not that only in the 15th 16th century humanity started studying matter in the vedas people have studied matter before but and there are some insights which are very valuable in that but when we turn to spirituality it is for the study of what matters and for all of us the initial shraddha that the world is that god matter that god exists god matters that initially god seems very small and shraddha can come in various ways but ultimately we want to come to the level of nishtha where we understand that god matters much more and that nishtha will come through personal practice that is bhajana kriya followed by personal transformation that is anartha nivritti and for that the important thing is we need to encourage people to practice bhakti a uh, practice spirituality and i give examples of how today uh, that science is not really needed to inspire people to practice spirituality i give the example of yoga of mantra chanting and mindfulness that people can turn towards spirituality because they feel a need and spirituality serves that need so we don't have to feel the need to push science down or stand on the shoulders of science to establish spirituality spirituality can have its own ground and it can stand on its own feet thank you very much hare krishna So any questions yes please there's a mic yeah uh, hari krishna prabhu ji please accept my humble obeisances thank you so much for this insightful lecture prabhu ji my question is that uh, we see that in uh, present scenario the most of the preaching approaches and uh, we use and the materials and modules that we use while preaching is based on confrontational approach on confrontational approach so inevitably and unwillingly also we have to use some statements and some can you give an example of confrontational approach Uh, like the sl slides we use and uh, they ha they have a particular section on embryology from shrimad bhagavatam wherein we try to reconcile the both and we also take an example of big bang theory and uh, we already have it in our slides so inevitably we have to use these uh, theories and we have to confront some things which we do not want well i am not saying confrontation should never be done see like prabhupad said we are against the atheism of science so if there is a theism being propagated in the name of science or using the name of science then that has to be challenged and countered so for example if somebody says that the idea of the soul is unscientific well we may we need to establish that there is there may not be scientific proof but there are significant scientific pointers there is a decent level of evidence by which the case for the existence of the soul can be made so i'm not saying that we should never confront that is that will not work at all what is that recently i saw a, a poster they said you know if you want to make everyone happy this distribute free ice creams <laughs> <laughs> you know you can't be a spiritualist you can't be a preacher you can't be a teacher you can't be a leader there are people who want to be unhappy isn't it <laughs> so there are people who are going to get upset by what we're going to say 
I'm not saying that we should never confront. All that I'm saying is there is no need for unnecessary confrontation. Now, specifically, which confrontation is necessary, which confrontation is not necessary? That different uh, devotees and different preachers, based on their experiences, will have different understandings. And I don't think there has to be necessarily one approach. That should, should there be less confrontation, more confrontation, no confrontation, full confrontation? Well, <laughs> there are different approaches and different devotees may prefer different approaches. So, I think we need to observe what works for us, in our, for our audience and we adapt. So, I don't think it's that if we decide that, okay, I don't want to, if I'm doing a course, we can talk with our devotees, senior devotees nearby and see, okay, maybe I don't want to sp uh, speak on these slides. That I don't think anybody is going to uh, say that you have committed a, an offense to the holy name by removing this slide from your presentation. <laughs> <laughs> it's not like that. So, we have to see what really works in our context and adapt it accordingly. And I, what I am saying is not that this is the only approach. I am just saying that my experience was this is what works. And sometimes, I see in many ways, maybe 20 years before, 15 years before, when people didn't have access to the internet, you know, we could rely on people's ignorance for the success of our preaching. <laughs> now, now also people may be ignorant. I'm not disrespecting people by saying that. And I'm, I'm, not, I'm not even criticizing our past uh, ways of preaching. All that I'm saying is that in the past, people didn't know now also people may not know, but they have access to ways of knowing. Now whether the ways of knowing really need to correct knowledge or not, that depends. But the point is, we can't just assume that people will accept because people just don't know anything about the subject. So that is not there. They have at least information at their fingertips. And so it's a changed landscape. And when the landscape is changed, we have to also adapt appropriately so that we are dealing with, we are not fighting the battle of yesterday today, isn't it? So it's like uh, we cannot be fighting with bows and arrows when the opposite side has machine guns, isn't it? So we have to fight the battle of today, today. Okay. Thank you. Let's go. Krishna Ji, thank you so much for this insightful lecture. Uh, probably my question is that scriptures, uh, like uh, when scriptures provide end result but not the process, so people find difficult to have faith on such things. But when the science uh, provide end result, but not the process, for example, the creation of life. Like Shri Prabhupada says that science cannot create even a blade of grass. And uh, like uh, they say that uh, matter comes together and forms life. Yes. But people uh, easily uh, have, uh, can place their faith on such statements rather than, scientific, rather than scriptures. Yes. So why is it so? Yeah, see the thing is that this is an elaborate subject. But in science, theories are def developed in three different ways. One is what is called as the inductive method, which is the most common. Inductive means you do 50 experiments and 50 times something works. So Newton saw object falling and he repeated, okay, this object, apple fell, a stone fell here, a stone fell not just in London, but in Paris, in Melbourne, here, there, repeated experiments. So inductive method is the most common. Now there is another method that is deductive method. Deductive method is basically mostly maths. So Einstein said very, very little of reality can actually be come from the deductive method. Now, when science is using deductive, this is not exactly Arohan and Virohan Pantha that we talk about. Arohan, that's different. <laughs> deductive is basically 3 plus 7 is 10. That is just an axiomatic truth. So science has some things which are axiomatic. Some things which are the result of experiment. Now, there are some theories which science arrives at by what is called as the abductive method. Abductive method is what abducts our intelligence. <laughs> Not necessarily. See, abductive method is where science does not have the possibility to do repeated experiments. Say, for example, if the scientist has the idea of the continental drift theory. So they say that India, was a pa India and Africa were one continent in the past. Then India drifted away and India collided with the Asian continent and that's how the Himalayas rose. Now that is a theory, now there is some basis for it in, as, as per the scientific method, but 
they cannot use the inductive method for that because you cannot do repeated experiments about this so generally for fields like history fields like archaeology fields like cosmology much of this in these fields is comes from the inductive method and if we study serious if we study science if we talk with serious scientists they will themselves acknowledge that what theories that come from the abductive method are not as credible as theories that come from the inductive method so most of the faith of people in science comes from the theories that have been developed by the abductive method and that works sorry by the inductive method so if i turn on my phone and try to call someone i am able to call most of the times you know if i if i turn on the car the car moves so these are laws of mechanics laws of electromagnetic principle of electromagnetics and all these these are largely products of the inductive method so science all science is not born equal so that's why rather than criticizing science we have to understand that different science is in different category and we need to establish that see we have nothing against the theory of gravity now we have concerns about the theory of evolution called the both claim to be science they are not science at the same level evolution is not something which is proven by the inductive method hmm? at least if the claims of evolution to bring about all the varieties of species that life forms change that is something which is always observed mutations happen and that's how when the covid was there covid kept the virus kept mutating and that's why medicines were not working so that is fine enough but that life forms change does not mean that the change of life forms has given rise to all the life forms that these are two very different ideas so we need to target properly within science so there are theories from the abductive method which are questionable and they need to be questioned but most people don't understand the difference that all science is not born equal so if somebody has a lot of faith in science then we have to educate them like say kashmir was a very big problem maybe 10 years ago 15 years ago now tourism is flourishing in kashmir how did it happen india did not say oh kashmir itself was a problem just bomb kashmir and destroy everyone over there no there were some elements which were anti india insurgents they were curbed and eventually crushed at least whatever extent is possible there were neutral elements they were won over there were pro pro india elements which were empowered so same way science also there are elements within science which are anti spiritual there are elements within science which are pro spiritual there are science elements in science which are non spiritual so we need to be more targeted in our attack okay thank you yes please hari krishna puri thank you so much for this fund of lecture uh, prabhu ji uh, i had one doubt like there is like certain uh, type of people uh, who have uh, who has so much interest on like self help topics uh, mindfulness and like brain and all things but uh, like when we talk to them about spirituality so like i have got one of my friends so like he has like so much interest in all of these topic but like when we go about spirituality so like they have very strong faith in so many scientific theories like theory of evolution and like uh, multiple theories and they have they have so many strong argument in facts like uh, rat and human share common dna and like we were from africa and multiple things and so at that time <coughs> we are not able to like uh, convince them and uh, build faith in them so what to do at at that time prabhu ji so choose your battles that you know it is not necessary for us to uh, where human beings came from is important but what will give human beings fulfillment that is even more important so origin is important but meaning and purpose and destiny is even more important so spirituality gives us a vision of origins but more importantly it helps us find meaning and purpose in life so if somebody is uh, interested in mindfulness and things like that then focus on that and so how the gita offers us a model of the self which how does mindfulness work now i have written a book for specific the mindfulness audience called you are you are not your mind so basically there i don't for them where is their faith from there you build it up so if for them these issues are difficult to accept because they have so many other ideas 
those battles can be fought when they need to be fought. See, in the first canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, uh, uh, let's take a two exa- another example. When Prabhupada was in Hawaii, some devotees came to him and they said that, that Prabhupada, when we talk with the scholars and we tell them that the Bhagavad, that Ugrasen, who was the king of Dwarka, had some astronomical number of guards, they start laughing at us. They say, you know, Dwarka is such a small place. If you had millions and billions and trillions of guards, where would all, the, all of, where are their homes? Where are their toilets? How would they move about? <laughs> now, Prabhupada could have said, Krishna is inconceivable. Krishna can maintain the entire population of the universe on one tip of a needle. Prabhupada could have said that, but Prabhupada's approach was remarkably non-confrontational. <laughs> Prabhupada said, among all the thousands of the verses in the Bhagavatam, was that the only thing you found to speak to the scholars? <laughs> Is that the most important thing that we need to speak? We have limited time with people. Twice Prabhupada was asked, you know, what if, some, if somebody wanted to study a very small sample of your teachings, what would you consider the most important teachings? So, Professor Thomas Hopkins asked him. So, Prabhupada said that those two verses, 1, 2, 9 and 10, Kamasyana Indriya Preeti Labho Jiveta Yavata That life's ultimate purpose is spiritual growth, not material gratification. So, that's it, Prabhupada, Prabhupada said that is the most important thing in his teachings. So, I think we need to choose our battles. So, if we just focus on what they can accept at that stage and move forward. Okay? Yes, Achyadana Prabhu. Hare Krishna Prabhuji, thank you for this lecture. And uh, Prabhuji, uh, I have two questions. Uh, Prabhuji, first is that uh, what I could conclude that in the initial part we discussed about how Lokik Shraddha comes in three ways. And uh, this Shraddha uh, does not live much. Uh, and we have to develop Shastrik Shraddha, uh, which, which is based on the uh, as per the lecture, that, that is based on ki how I am getting transformed. Is that right understanding, Prabhuji? See, I'm not sure what the word Shastrik Shraddha means. Because I have seen it used in different contexts in different ways. Laukik Shraddha is a fair enough term for it. From the material we develop, so it is spiritual. Because in Shastra also, there are many things which are taught. And not everything in Shastra is necessarily directly spiritual. Okay. Like say, Somebody can have a lot of faith in bhakti, but they may still have questions about cosmology mm. in the Bhagavatam Swift Canto. So, is there Shraddha Shastrik or not? Mm. So, I would prefer to use the word Adhyatmik Shraddha. So, now, now maybe Shastrik Shraddha, the way our Acharyas have used it in some places, it is the same as Adhyatmik Shraddha. But, uh, so, the 17th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, it talks about faith in the three modes. Mm. And, uh, now, that means faith is possible at various levels. So, Krishna does conclude by saying, saying that chapter by saying that we should focus on Shastra. But then, how does he define Shastra over there? If you go back to the previous verse, Tasmat Shastram Pramanam Te Karya Karya Vyavastitam. So, when you talk about Shastra, he's talking about guidance for living. He's not just talking about various elements of knowledge that might be given in various places. So, in that sense, Shastrik Shraddha can be said to be Adhyatmik Shraddha. So I would focus more on the point that the spiritual faith in terms of the transformation at the spiritual level that we experience individually. And like uh, what the point is and what the point of the point is. Uh, yeah, that is the one. Mm-hmm. Perfect. Yeah. Yes, please. And the second question is, Prabhuji, that uh, like you said that you uh, went somewhere and you asked that to give uh, scientific proofs of soul and they, are, they said that it is not much important. But we see that Prabhupada repeats this thing a lot, that we are not this body, we are spirit soul. No, 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 they're two different things. That the point that we are spiritual beings, that is a vital point. And that needs to be spoken. But whether the speaking of that point needs to be established scientifically. There are two different things. I am not saying that the soul itself is not an important point to talk about. It's definitely an important point. That's why I said, I just presented this is a model of the self, where there is body, mind and soul. And people, they are more interested in, okay, how does that model help me? 
how does it help me make sense of my behavior how, yeah so like, like like you just started with the chariot model if, if we can see i prefer the software model that the, the okay. body mind soul software. is like the hardware software and user yes yes so and then i talk about you know, how our drives come up where, where the mind is like a window where pop ups okay. happen and all those things mm -hmm. so it's not that soul is not important the teaching of soul is very important but establishing the point of the soul scientifically mm -hmm. is it important it is but i have not found it to be the most important thing mm -hmm. so i'm not saying we should not do it not at all see so i'm saying that what is the most important so uh, when so, we are uh, sorry, yeah so in our in our discover yourself oh, course yes. or somewhere like that we have we have evidence for the existence of god evidence for the existence of soul i'm not saying we should not have it that's not my point my point is that if somebody's faith is based on the fact that oh yan stevenson did so and so research and that proves the existence of the soul but maybe some other researcher comes up and finds some faults with the ans stevenson's method mm. or finds that some of his research was corrupted and that particular case was not actually as strong in evidence as possible should that shake the faith of someone no so it's it's okay that three different things the importance of the soul the importance of scientifically establishing the existence of the soul and the importance of basing our faith on the scientific proof for the existence of the soul the three different things mm -hmm. so what i am saying is our faith should not be based on scientific proof for spiritual things that could be a starting point but soon we should be able to help people move ahead from there is the difference clear yes sir so we can go with the old slides oh, of course for the time really <laughs> good that you asked that question but we should not give again the emphasis on the four points that consciousness and this and that see, but uh, we should move ahead and from what okay see even from what i have seen and uh, now your experience might be different each of us has different experience see, when i used to do the dis course also it is not that like uh, the existence of the soul or existence of god was like a like faith faith necessarily faith maker or faith breaker for people it is a, it is a important point but i think many times the idea of what i can practice how i can benefit from it becoming a part of a spiritual community you know having some finding some ultimate meaning of life and then the soul within that soul and god within that help us to have a meaningful vision of the world so it all contributes and definitely but i don't think this is the main thing so definitely our current scientific our current approach to outreach it's it's a it's a fair enough approach it's like we build a big temple so that we can attract people to come to a temple initially but how many times in our classes do we say just see how big a temple we have this proves that krishna is god <laughs> no we don't do that so in our initially we use certain approaches mm. so yes we give scientific evidence for the existence of soul that's perfectly fine but we don't have to stop but if somebody says oh you know i i went to i went to this city and there's such a small temple of iskon yeah, you know the temple is so small is iskon really right well if you think that the size of the temple determines the rightness of the philosophy that you are practicing then there's something seriously wrong with your practice of philosophy <laughs> isn't it so like that if somebody is faith initially we may build a big temple to attract people similarly initially we talk about scientific evidence but eventually we need to help people to base their faith on something much more personal okay thank you prabhu yes thank you so much prabhu ji uh, uh, i i have a question like uh, you mentioned uh, we started the faith start and with the material things and then it grows so sometimes happen uh, somebody is like saving a faith but uh, he he start thinking uh, like his faith is shattered down and now uh, i just wanted to i this is not a question i wanted to confirm from you like this is the faith has gone down because of his in, like you mentioned the because of his own practice that is not following prep, uh, particularly or it is something else that because various things various things we can't really say 
sometimes they may meet people who shake their faith isn't it sometimes if our somebody's faith is based on how how well behaved devotees are and they meet some devotee who doesn't behave well who misbehaves and think oh, you know okay maybe krishna consciousness is wonderful but these devotees are these devotees are not good in fact if you look at history one of the main reasons for atheism is misbehaving theists it is not so much the it is like priests who were exploitative abusive power hungry religious people who were too sentimental or hypocritical so that's one of the main causes of atheism historically speaking so if we are, we cannot make a categorical thing basically it could be a individual cause it could be a institutional cause both are possible in general the tendency is to blame the individual no, your sadhana was weak because of it you went away you did this you were doing this and there is truth to that it is good for the individual to take responsibility but it's also important for the institution to introspect you know are we doing something wrong because of which the faith is not coming faith is getting shaken for people okay thank you so much thank you mata ji you had a question you want to ask something yeah we'll stop with this hari krishna you said that uh, at some extent uh, science uh, is uh, working and the spirituality also but uh, we are living in krishna consciousness so i want to tell all bhaktas of uh, krishna consciousness that uh, even our olden time pushpak viman our rishis where the adhyatmika starts spirituality so it is much much more advanced than the science the science is everything is based on spirituality very well so yes yeah see the word veda the like krishna says veda uh, what is that veda ishu sarvai rahame veda no what was sarvasya cha aham rudi sannivishto matta smutir gyan apohanam cha videsh sarvai rahame vedya vidya vedanta krit veda videva cha aham so the word veda can mean the vedas themselves which is the the vedic text veda can mean knowledge so we can say that the vedic texts have come from krishna and we can also say that all knowledge has come from krishna so krishna can if krishna is the god of the whole universe can krishna not give some no really valid knowledge in the western world you know why do we have to limit krishna this way so in order to establish the faith in the vedas do we have to say that throughout human history krishna never worked outside india at all in the name of glorifying krishna we are limiting krishna so now that does not mean that every knowledge that everyone has got is right of course not but if some knowledge works we understand the same paramatma who is acting who is giving that knowledge so we can have a both a specific view as well as a universal view but the important thing is whether it is specific view or universal view we need to see beyond the immediate to the ultimate so our faith that okay certain knowledge is in the vedas should not just make us make us materialistic proud i see how great i am how great my country is no it is our focus should be how great krishna is then we can reconcile these different sources of knowledge thank you very much grantraj shrimad bhagavatam ki shri la prabhu pad ki gaur bhakt vrind ki tai gaur premanand